a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. My friend, my lawyer, and my co-author, Jamie Lieberman, is with me. That's right. Jamie is a co-author in the next book coming out, A Well-Designed Business, The Power Talk Friday Experts, Volume 2. That's right. Volume 2 is on its way, coming fall 2020. If you already have Volume 1, you know how valuable this resource is in running your interior design firm. And if you don't have it, go to Luann Nigara dot com forward slash book two to get your copy. So J.B. Lieberman is back. She was here last year, episode number 454. In that episode, we talked about we talked about contracts and about establishing your relationship with your lawyer. So I suggest you listen to that episode after you listen to this one. And if you're new to the podcast, Jamie Lieberman is an attorney, podcaster, and entrepreneur dedicated to making legal accessible and to sharing the message that legal does not have to be scary. As the owner and founder of Hashtag Legal, Jamie draws on her experience working with influencer marketing professionals, creatives, and business owners to help her clients grow and to protect their businesses. Jamie leads an all-female virtual team focused on providing clients with with advice on a wide range of subjects such as intellectual property, contracts, privacy, FTC, and general business law, as well as negotiation strategies. Jamie is a highly experienced speaker, and she is the co-host for the Fear Less Business podcast. In a second, we're going to learn from Jamie five steps to engaging effectively in any negotiation. You know how much I love this topic. And one of the reasons that I love negotiation strategies is because I know you can improve your profitability when you sharpen these skills. So before we get to Jamie, have you placed an order with Article yet? If you have, you already know how easy it is to work with the To The Trade team, which is led by Jillian Cross. She herself was an interior designer. If you haven't listened to episode number 367 yet, I suggest you do. You'll hear in Jillian's words how Article can support you in delivering quality mid-century Scandinavian-inspired furniture for your projects. Then go head over and set up your trade account today at welldesign.com article.com. All righty, let's get to this episode with Jamie Lieberman. Hi, Jamie. Thanks so much for coming back to a well-designed business today. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh my goodness, Jamie, you're like one of my favorite people on the planet. (laughs) My whole day. Anytime (laughs) I get to talk to you, it's, it's a good day. You know, and it's so funny because, um, I I say this about you all the time, and I have to say you are one of the co-authors in the next Power Talk Friday Experts book that's coming out this November 2020, so yay on that. I know, right? But you know how the book goes. So I write an introduction chapter and an outro chapter, and then every one of you that has your goodness in between, I write an intro, outro for each of you, and I just wrote yours just last week. And so you've been on my mind all week. So it's really funny that here I am knee deep into your chapter and knee deep into writing about you. And then we had a professional call the other day because you're my lawyer. Yes. <laughs> I know. And then, of course, today we're doing this. So um, I, I love being in your world now. I love it because I, I really do respect and admire you as a person and, and what you bring to being a lawyer. We just... Um, You know, it's funny because we talk all the time how 
important it is for us to have professionals in our lives, the CPAs, the lawyers, the bookkeepers. But very often, and I know that you know this too, Jamie, very often as entrepreneurs, we'll settle for less than, like my cousin Eileen Hahn says, exceptional service from professionals that we sort of put in this little like a like a little pedestal so CPAs lawyers doctors where we're like well you know my doctor makes me wait an hour and you know a half until I see him but you would never do that if your hairstylist made you wait an hour and a half for the appointment every time you'd go to a different hairstylist or you'd say to her lady this can't happen. I'm <laughs> running a business. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But but the thing is, is that I do know that people will accept what I call bad behavior from certain level of professionals that we just have come to accept it from. And I love that you don't operate that way. You're like Peter Lang, the designer CPA. You operate it, your business, your law firm like a real business that, you know, we're your clients and you care about us. <laughs> you know, you treat us with respect. I just love it. Thank you. Yeah. That was actually honestly one of my biggest complaints in my previous practice was just how I felt there was such a disconnect between client communication. It's just, it was as if the lawyers were doing a favor for the client. Yeah, <laughs> versus- that's that's it. It's yeah. so true. And it's so funny because I don't I don't think I've ever told you this, but I when I was young, right before I worked for Vin at Window Works, uh, my job before that, I worked for this big law firm in New York City and I was a oh. receptionist. There were three hundred and fifty lawyers and um, it was crazy. I worked there maybe four months. And the number, the number one reason I left, I was like, Gwen, you're not selling anything to anybody and you're bored out of your mind. That's the number <laughs> one reason I left. Cause I was like, what are you doing? And then the second reason I left was I was not built for those lawyers to be so rude every single day to those of us that worked the phone bank. And I just, I remember thinking to myself, there are 16 phone lines coming into this 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 bank at, that ring off the hook. There's 350 of you. Each of you have a three a three um, number extension, and each of you has a an assistant, a secretary with the three digit exp- extension. Not to mention all of the administrative personnel. And I remember, like, if every once in a while you would send the wrong call to the wrong extension, like. They would come out from their office. How dare you say, and I'm like, I, like, I was not built for that because my brain was like, look, buddy, <laughs> like, yeah. you got to be kidding me, but this is your big problem today. You answer Joe Blow's phone call. Like, what is going on here? You know? It is so Ugh. true. It, I, that was my whole first half of my career Ugh. was being screamed at by people who were not respectful. And I was a lawyer. <laughs> like, oh and and I, can you imagine the people that weren't or the clients Ugh. or there is just, there is just this, this pedestal. It's exactly what you're talking about. And I never liked it, thought it was appropriate, yeah. ever wanted to practice that way. Yeah. I was far too practical yes. <laughs> to make it. Cause I don't think a lawyer should stand in the middle of a business decision and blow it up on principle, which lawyers do all the time. Know, they blow up right. deals for reason. I'm like, why are you doing this? We can work around this. We can right. make this work. There are some times where I absolutely have to say, I do not recommend you do that. Mm-hmm. That should be your deal breaker. Right. But so many times there's so much more flexibility that you can actually have. And it mm-hmm. just, lawyers just are so one track mind, but it's crazy. I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of people just sort of deal with it from their lawyers. I have, I hear horror story after horror story from clients of mine of their past lawyers. And I just, I just shake my head. It's mm. just, it shouldn't, it should not be that way. Yeah. And that's the thing. And I just feel like a lot of the time, you know, my message in person with my friends, with the designers that I meet, it's like, if you're getting treated poorly by anybody that you're hiring, stop like yeah. stop you it's crazy and so and so and that's the other thing that i really like about you Jamie is that you know we've had a couple of situations you and i where you know you're trying to explain to me you know somebody maybe a nuance in a contract or something that i've got with somebody or whatever and you're just like you'll finally i'll be like i i ask you like five times i'm like right but i still don't get it and you just keep coming back and you're like da 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 and then finally i i remember one time i just said to her okay here's the thing 
I really just need you to tell me if I should do it or not. <laughs> you know, because I'm I'm following it now, but I, this doesn't seem like a big deal for me to give in on. Am I missing the forest through the trees? And that's where you're just like, you're absolutely not missing anything. You're so right. Your instinct is right. We can let this go. And I'm like, thank you. As opposed to, because even in that moment, other lawyers would be like, well, you know, you're still this, that, and the other thing, like you said, on principle, or not just giving me the the off the like the outside it like come on we don't need to make this crazy low you know what i'm saying so i it's appreciate that, you it's that five percent chance that something bad can happen that every lawyer is afraid is going to happen but <laughs> nothing is guaranteed there's not you know i think anytime you have a great relationship with a client they understand like i can give my best recommendations as much as i wish i was i am not a fortune teller, <laughs> so i do not know if the 5% chance is going to happen right. but it's just it's that conversation and when you work with someone long enough you get to know them i know your risk tolerance some other clients i may say that is your deal breaker right. but that's also about knowing your business and knowing your boundaries <laughs> right right no that's so true that you say that that's so interesting we just had a conversation recently um, working with our business coach my cousin eileen han she coaches Ben and Bill and myself, and of course, we've been meeting a lot during this COVID-19, <laughs> and um, one of the sentences she just said last week to us, and she looked at the three of us, and she said, I just want to remind all of you that you are partners, that you've worked together for 39 years, and you know that what this next sentence is, but sometimes it needs to be said out loud. Luann and Vin have a much higher tolerance for risk than mm -hmm. Billy does. Yes. You know, and yes. and so it's like not, you know, you just like, oh, that's right. We're just a little on the edge crazy and he's conservative. Like, yes. You know, it's and it doesn't make one right or wrong. It's just a ha Oh, yeah. Come on back to that. Come yes. on back to that. And let's understand, because in this environment with what's going on with businesses now, you know, we were having, we, thankfully, I mean, oh my God, we get along so well, all of us. It's, this was not a conversation that reached any level beyond just discussion, but it was like with me and Vin going, we got this, come on, blah, blah, blah. and Billy going, <laughs> well, couldn't we this and couldn't we that? And we're just like, dude, it's fine. And, and that's when she said, she goes, I just want to remind you that your personalities are all very different. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. And so I just, you have, that's the beauty of having that long-term relationship. Now I can look at it and be like, Luann's not going to care about this. She's going <laughs> right. to be fine with it. But I do know what you do care about. Right. Because right. we all have those limits. We all have the things that matter to us. That's right. I love it. I love it. So I just have to say that, um, you know, I'm just so thrilled and honored that you are going to be in the book. Um, and cr crazily, you know, in the book, you talk about the importance of contracts and everything, and you give some great examples, but we're not going to talk about that today. So mm -hmm. we're going to leave that for the book. Um, today, I wanted to talk to you about negotiation because, mm -hmm. you know, I know you are the queen of negotiation. This is one of the pillars that you talk about, you teach on, and this is probably another reason why that it was so drawn to you from the beginning. Um, because for me, you know, I've studied sales since I'm 10 years old and negotiation is like one of my first loves right in that sales game. And Jamie, I have said to many, many of the designers in person and again on the podcast through the years that I know that you might not really want to study sales. You might not want to really think of yourself as a salesperson, but we know if you're an entrepreneur, you're the rainmaker. And I got news for you. If you're the rainmaker, you're the salesperson, right? But I also have encouraged designers to sharpen their sales skills, to listen to podcasts like yours and to our friend Kwame Christian's podcast, right? Because in learning the nuance of negotiation, you know, it's, I know that the further you take your business up the food chain, this can happen at any level where any client that you deal with, no matter what they do for a living and where they are in the, in the income stratus, you know, at, like that. But it is certainly much more prevalent when you start to get up to the upper luxury market where you're dealing with Wall Street traders and hedge fund guys and lawyers and people that – you know, quite frankly, we'll negotiate for sport. I mean, I, I love <laughs> negotiating for sport. I'm going to tell you point, point blank. You know what I mean? And so I feel like there is a strong message to bring to interior designers to understand some of the strategies uh, surrounding negotiation. Do you agree? 
A hundred percent. I think every single person, particularly those who are creative and in the services field, um, this tends to be an area that uh, many of those entrepreneurs shy away from. And I think it's so critical to right. success in business. Because the thing is, what it is, is, is like I said, it's uh, even when I, and, and I, I hate to use me as an example, but it's so true. And the, what I'm, and I, it's, what I want you to understand is you can be a really good person. You do not have to be this swarmy, you know, negative car salesman y out for yourself person and still enjoy a good negotiation. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> negotiation is actually about collaboration. And so when I think we take our, our headspace out of what you said, which is that used car salesman where you walk in, you're like, okay, I want to pay 20000 He wants me to pay 40000 So now I'm going to pay 30000 right. That's not negotiation. Haggling over dollars right, and cents right. and pennies, that's not negotiation. Negotiation, you, should, you need to take a holistic approach to it. And there are like five steps before you even start to talk about dollars. And that is not even the only thing you're negotiating. So I think once we come out of the mindset that negotiation is this smarmy, salesy, like right. not good feeling. It's kind of the same way people about feel about networking. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think networking when done correctly is amazing. You just connect with really cool people <laughs> and it's awesome. Right. And much like that with negotiation, it really is like, let me see how you and I can work together and make us both feel great about it. Right. Like I'm always saying is, you know, the best sale on the planet is the win-win that both yeah. people go, yay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I love this. This just worked out perfect, right? Yeah. But yeah. sometimes there is some conversation to get you both to what feels like the win-win. And for me, and you're going to go through those five steps with this, but for me, I also really value and appreciate the negotiation process because it is my opportunity if a person is willing to come to the table with me and talk to me about their needs and put their non-negotiables and their negotiables on the table. Now, there's different ways to do that, and we're going to get to that. But now I can be crafting for the win-win. It's yeah. not about, oh, I get everything on my side of the plate. It's like, well, what can I leave on your side that you're going to feel great about? Because then I can take that thing over there that I want on my side. Right. That's exactly yeah. right. And that's why there's so many steps before you're even going to get to the actual bargaining, which is what you're, most people think of as negotiation. Right. There is so much strategy and research that goes into a true negotiation that by the time you get to bargaining, it's an afterthought. Right. It it's really just is. like we're doing the deal. Just write yeah. the check. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's yes. exactly right. But most people want to lead in with, I need a thousand dollars. Right. And the other side's like, why do you need a thousand dollars? I'm going to pay you a thousand dollars. I don't know anything about you. You. Exactly. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. So, so, and the thing is that, so on one level, there is that negotiation that, 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 that highly skilled, that does it for a living, you know, is at the end going to then engage and spar and put those other things. But to your point, let's take it back to just let's work towards the win-win. Let's see all the signs that the other person is giving, that that's something important to them. Let's see what we can do to show that we're interested in getting to the win-win. So start us off, Jamie. You know, you're saying there's five steps before we even get to the money contract. What do we, where do we want to exactly. go? So your first step is strategy. You have to sit down and think about what do I want? <laughs> so many people don't do that. They skip right in and they're like, well, I want a thousand dollars. Okay. No, but like, what do you really want? And it's not just about the money, but why are you going to enter into this transaction? Most entrepreneurs have multiple motivators. It isn't just about the money. We like the money. Please right. don't let me think that like we're all doing things for free. Right. Everybody loves the money, but we also do it for a lot of other reasons. There's multiple reasons why you want to enter into a transaction. Some of which have nothing to do with money. Um, and so think about what you want from this particular transaction that's going to be happening. And then think about what is your bare bones minimum? Where is my point where I'm going to walk away? And this is the big one that a lot of people don't think about. You have to be able to say no. You mm -hmm. have to. So you have to get comfortable with saying no and feeling strongly about it and being okay with walking away. If one of those knows 
is one of your deal breakers and knowing what those are. It's like what we talked about. Like I knew that the thing you're mentioning, like I knew that that wasn't a deal breaker for you, right. but I also know what is your deal breaker where you're like, nope, I'm out. This right. is done. So you got to know those and you have to be prepared to walk away because well, if you're not, you don't have a negotiation. <laughs> it's the truth. And you know what's so funny is everybody that listens to this podcast on a regular basis is hearing what I always say. Know what you will do and know what you will not do. I love that. So it's, you know, the strategy. What do I want? Think about it before you go into the conversation and understand that there are multiple motivators and pluses that you can craft in a deal that are in addition to the money and then to understand what you will definitely not leave the table without. That's exactly right. And I like to call them options and currencies. So instead of like focusing on dollars and this and that, these are all of our currencies and they all have a value. Um, And so that's really important. And so thinking about what are all my currencies, what are all the the best case scenario? And you also have to set that best case scenario. In an ideal world, if there's like rainbows, sunshine, and puppies everywhere, like (laughs) what am I getting? What is like the magic moment where the heavens shine down? What does that look like? And this is where a lot of people have that mindset issue knowing your value, knowing your worth, you have to set them high. You cannot edit yourself. So I challenge clients that I talk to when I coach them on negotiation, write down what first comes in your head. Mm -hmm. You are not allowed to cross it out because the first thing that comes into your head is what you want. You don't Mm -hmm. give yourself a chance to edit it. So you might be like, I want 10,000. No, I'm not worth $10,000. No, you write that $10,000 down and you write, I want those pictures. And you write all the things that you want. If you're like writing Dear Diary, (laughs) (laughs) no one's going to know it because no one may ever see it. But you have to know what your aspiration is and you have to be willing to start that high because you're just negotiating against yourself at this point. (laughs) Right. That's the other thing. You've already notched yourself down two or three spots before you even try (laughs) to see what would happen, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, the worst thing that happens in these situations, if you go too high, is the other side's like, that's out of our budget. You're like, okay, well, let's talk about your budget. Like, <laughs> it's, just, it's not a door closed. Right. It, it's, and the best case scenario is they're like, yeah, that's cool. That's in our budget. And you're like, oh my God, it's right. in their budget. Like, <laughs> that's amazing. So strategize. And I really challenge um, anybody to sit down and write this down. However you best get your brain dump out. I mm-hmm. tend to be a notebook writer. Some people like to type, some people, whatever the case may be, actually write it down, challenge it and sit down. It could take you 15, 20 minutes because it should really be stream of consciousness. Mm. Um, and the other thing that you really want to think about in this strategy is thinking about what the other side wants. Mm. So there's a lot of David and Goliath, particularly with entrepreneurs who may be going to work with large companies, or if you feel like you're talking about like the very high in the luxury end market, like that high end, you know, hedge fund manager who, you know, has a very large budget and you really want to work with them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you think to yourself, like, what do they want? Why did they come to me? And so you have value. And so you have to know that they didn't just come to you because of how much you cost. They came to you for other reasons. Mm-hmm. Your Instagram feed is amazing. Their wife, you know, or husband's best friend is like, this is the most amazing designer. You have to work with her, that kind of thing. So there's other currency that are involved, which make you awesome. And you need to think about like, what am I offering to them that makes me different? What makes me unique? And what are their interests? What are they looking to accomplish? You may not know the answers to these questions yet, but you may know you're going to do your research. You're going to find out more about them. You're going to get the information, whether it's your intake form, whether it's the referral, whatever the case may be. And you're going to think to yourself, like, why are they coming to me in the first place? And what are they hoping to achieve? They may want somebody who is going to take complete charge of the situation and ask them one question and they answer it. And then you take off running. Or they may want someone who's going to hold their hand through each step of the process. Mm -hmm. You need to know what you can offer and why your interest, what you have that's interesting to them and look at where those interests align. And then once you sort of think about what their interests are, you're going to figure out all the holes of the things you don't know and the information that you need to get. And that's when we move on to the next phase. Okay. All right. I love it. I mean, and the truth is, you said you're going to do everything you can to ascertain this information, right? So you maybe you've had a, a, a discovery call. Maybe they have filled out your intake process. Maybe just just how they found out about your design firm gives you some sort of information to this insight, right? I mean, all of these things, it's like putting together 
all of the pieces of a puzzle. We don't have all of the pieces at this point, but we put together as much as we can to say, what do I expect that they're going to want from this? What What is it that, like you said, why are they coming to me? Because I love that, Jamie, because that makes you sit there and go, hmm, this is my strong point here. This is where mm-hmm. I'm going to, this is where I'm going to be able to lean into this. And also for me, I don't know if it's part of your next steps because I didn't ask you what your five steps were before we started talking. <laughs> but I know for me, if when I start to figure that out, whether I'm supposing it or I'm sure of it, I know that my conversation starts to present that. It's like I keep letting yeah. you know that's what I'm bringing you, buddy. That's what I'm bringing you. So you, I may be, you know, taking your steps away. Let's see what number two is. No, no, no. You are, you are right. You are down the road, but you are 100% <laughs> Okay. Right. So the next thing is going to be your next conversation with them. So you've strategized. You have all the information that you think you need to know, and it's okay to have holes. So mm-hmm. it's not like you need to go in knowing everything. Otherwise, you wouldn't need to talk to them. And so this is usually where that discovery call or even a second call will happen. Um, and so the most important part is setting the climate. And so I am a very much in the idea of collaboration. So you have to walk in there knowing this is a win-win. Like I am 100% a slam dunk for you. I meet all of your needs, both on, you know, what I offer, what my aesthetic is, what my pricing is. And so this is a complete no brainer. So you should be really positive in going in just like an excitement to have the conversation. And it should be just very upbeat and your attitude should be like conversational and energetic and it should really suggest that an agreement can be reached. You don't need to say that, but just in your like conversation, it can, it should just be very, not overly confident, but just really positive. Like I'm so excited for us to think about working together. Um, I want to learn more about you. Um, I want to see how we could be a fit together. So you're talking in a really positive way, but not overly assuming that this is going to happen. Right. And there's a fine line there setting that climate. When I have those first initial conversations, I try to make that conversation not go straight into business. And it can be something very small, but to just try to connect with someone. And this is where I highly encourage telephone or in-person meetings. Negotiating over email just does not work. Um, Although many people try to do it and I don't know why. Um, But you got to get on a call or you got to have an in-person meeting because you need to have that in-person personal connection. Um, And that's really important. So get on that call, even if you hate having phone calls. (laughs) I agree. That is so because, you know, otherwise it really, I, I mean, there's so much for me that I learn in the way that you say something and mm-hmm. when you speed up and talk happy and fast and excited and when I say something and I hear a little hesitation or a little surprise, it's like, oh, okay. Like I just feel like you gather so much information mm-hmm. that's not actually said that is always going to be you know, valuable down the road when you're now rounding all of the troops and trying to come up with the, the boat, what's going to make both sides happy, right? That's exactly right. And tone is a huge part of that. Like you said, you can't read tone in an email Mm -mm. and you may read the tone wrong, Mm -hmm. you know? And so those are often really critical mistakes that happen in negotiations that are mostly happening electronically. So when in doubt, get on the phone when you're negotiating. It isn't to say that you can't conduct business via email. Certainly mm-hmm. getting getting things in writing, you know, is going to be my happy place. <laughs> but uh, but negotiations, I'm, I'm all for that in person or telephone conversation. I think it makes a difference. So in that call, our next phase is going to be getting information. In this discovery call, you should be listening 70% of the time, mm. talking 30. And when you're listening, you are active listening. And so many of us don't active listen, particularly in this day and age of constant multitasking and checking our phone and looking at our email and doing all these things. And so active listening means I am solely listening to the words that you're saying. I'm not thinking about my next sentence, my next question. I'm not thinking about what I cook for dinner or whether I left my curling iron plugged in. (laughs) Like all I'm doing is just thinking about what you're saying and I'm absorbing it. I struggle with this. This is hard for me to just listen. I typically need to do more than one thing. I'm like my elementary school age child <laughs> who requires something in his hands when he's on his, his, uh, in school or on like a call or something. And so I take notes. That's what I, I do. That's so funny. I do the exact same thing. I write, well, when I do the podcast, I'm writing the whole time you're talking and I do it when too. I'm in important conversations. <laughs> me too. And there's actually a big respect there because I say, what I say to the person that I'm talking to is, 
I just want to get your permission to take notes. I do this so I make sure that I'm getting everything from you because this conversation is really important to me. Mm -hmm. And I've never had anyone say no. (laughs) So it works and it makes them feel very important. And so taking notes, if you are unable to just listen to someone as they're talking, which is very challenging. I think you and I, Luann, have very similar personalities. Um, and so <laughs> our minds are always going. So that's, that. I learned it in law school, honestly, because I would sit through three hours of lectures and I'm ready to jump out a window, but I had to hear it. Yes. I had to be absorbing what they're saying. So I just would literally type everything my professor was saying and that's how it sunk in my brain. Mm-hmm. And well, and I do it too. I mean, of course, when I do the podcast, I end up with at least two pages of notes for every episode because while it's exactly that, the active listening, I want to know exactly what you're saying. My mind, I don't want my mind wandering off. I want to ask you a question about what you're talking about, not the question that I've had on my list that might be coming in 10 minutes, right? Yeah. But also too, when I'm in conversations that are negotiation type conversations like so maybe there's a an organization that wants to hire me to speak or it's a client that we're you know getting set up and getting off the ground for window works or something i am taking notes that whole time because again not only does it help you to active listen that's 70 percent but mm-hmm. Um, when I'm listening that closely, that's when I'm getting those cues, right? Mm-hmm. I'm hearing those things. And then what's interesting is sometimes the things that people say are like, oh my goodness, that's the key to the kingdom right there. Like, yes. like that's the line, like, yes. you know, right? It's like yes. it, on a, such a silly level, on such a little silly level, it could be Maybe I've been having an intake conversation with somebody for window works and they're talking about how they want to do this amazing awning and they want their backyard and blah, 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 blah. And they're talking all about that. But all of a sudden in the line is, in the conversation is, we're having a wedding party for our daughter with 200 people. And I'm like, oh, there's the money line. That's it right there. (laughs) Exactly right. That's the currency. That's the intangible. Right. That's the thing that you're looking for. It's not the money. Right. It's almost, it's so, right. when you're in the high end luxury goods, yep. it's just get it's this thing up before money. this wedding lady. There's <laughs> a, pain, a need, a pain point. You got to find that pain point and show how you're going to meet that pain point. Right. That's what it is. And so the way that you find that out is by asking open-ended questions. Mm. You should be like a, you should be like a kid. If you ever talk to a child, they are going to ask you 17,000 <laughs> questions with no agenda. <laughs> they just literally crave information, right? Like you're just like, Oh my God, why are you asking me this? But they just want to know all the things. And so I approach every conversation with like, I want to know all the things. I want to know all about you. I don't want to just know about this one project. I want to understand your business in full because that's going to help me down the road. And so asking those open-ended questions like why, tell me how, allows them to keep talking Mm. and to give them wide range to decide how they want to answer. And the other really powerful thing that I always tell people about is pause. Mm. Pause when they stop talking. One, they may start talking again, which would be amazing. Um, But two, it allows you to just gather your thoughts. Um, And so that's really important. But the pause is so powerful. It basically... People don't like silence. <laughs> I know. You get so much information when you just keep oh, your mouth shut. <laughs> yes, it's unbelievable. So you just give like a five second pause and nine times out of 10, they'll start talking again. Mm-hmm. And that's where you get those wedding gems that you talked about. And the other is reverse is true. What I would really get it is when you're in a tough conversation, let them talk. And when they stop, because somebody is super agitated, it's going to talk for a long time. I said, and you're going to be inclined to want to butt in and say, no, but that's not what happened. And oh, but the, the contractor, this, and it wasn't me. Just let them go, let them go, let them go, let them go and let them stop. And I said, and stay quiet. And then I said, they're going to talk again. And then they're going to da, da, da. I said, it'll probably take them three times before they actually stop. And each time they'll say less each time, but the third time is when they'll probably be like, wait, are you still there? (laughs) And then you're like, now you've been listening. They've repeated themselves 15 times in the three first and the three times they started and stopped. And if you're paying attention and writing your notes, you've learned where the actual pain point is that they're upset about because I, it's very rarely the first thing they're going to say to you out the gate, right? I love that advice. That is the best advice for conflict resolution. 
you just got to let people go sometimes. Just let them out. Let them have it And out. it also doesn't mean that you have to take abuse. And no. I think a lot of people think that those two are equivalent. They're not. No. There's a very big difference between somebody who's saying horrible things to you and somebody who's very... That's, and somebody's that's venting, right. And if you know, like, look, if this is your client that's venting, you, you know, you owe it to them to hear it. You've engaged yeah. with them. You're doing business with them. And by the way, they don't just vent for no reason, usually. We all have that 1% yeah. of people that go off the rails and gosh knows what the hell happened. <laughs> but most of the time, we can trace it back to where we dropped the ball. And, and, and yeah. that's what you got to do. So, but it's the same thing for your point in the introduction of the relationship is that to mm -hmm. really listen and when they stop talking, let the pause be there because they may start and say some more things, which is going to give you more insights onto what their currencies are that they're looking for. Right, Jamie? That's exactly right. That's exactly. And it works really, really well. And the nice thing too, is if say they don't start talking again, or they're finally the thought is completed, you can repeat their statements to clarify just, just so I understand correctly. Like this is very important. Your daughter's wedding is really important to you. And it's on this date. Yes. And you can, you always want to acknowledge them as well. And, and prepping questions in advance, it helps. It definitely helps. But like you said, with the podcast, you also want to follow the conversation. Mm -hmm. So you want to have the information you need to get before you leave. It just may, you need to be flexible in where and when you're getting it. Um, so I like to think of it like a funnel. There's like a topic that I need to know all about and I'm going to funnel it down till I get to the very bottom and I know all that information and then I'm going to move to my next topic. Um, and so make sure that I can check off every single topic and by that point, when you finally get through all your topics, you get all the information, a lot of times the parties are going to walk away and you're going to say, you know what, I have all the information I need. Thank you so much. I'm going to pull together a proposal for you and I'm going to have it to you in the next two days. Um, sometimes they want to hear something almost immediately, but for a really long sales process, it tends to take a little while, right? Mm -hmm. We're not going to be giving them, you know, a hundred thousand dollar quote <laughs> as you're sitting there. You want to be able to think it through. And so at that moment, you want to make sure that you've clarified all their position. You understand what their interests are. Um, and once you know that you can then walk away and you can make in your next phase, when you're sort of sitting and absorbing everything, looking at your notes, it's kind of like a Venn diagram, right? Like you have your interests and positions and you have their interests and positions and you need to see where they meet in the middle because all of those things don't need to be negotiated. Right. Um, they can go away. And then you literally usually come down to a very small number of items that actually end up getting negotiated. So that bargaining that felt so overwhelming is now maybe two pieces of the puzzle. Mm, exactly. And so you're able to really focus and make sure that you get, you don't have all, um, you're not going back and forth on a hundred different things. Right, right. Right. I love it. It just, you know, and it's so nice because if you do ultimately have the one or two areas you're not you know constantly rehashing all the things that you agree on right it's yeah. like well, those right. are done can we just yeah. you know, those are good yeah. we're, we're both happy there <laughs> and i actually like to lead with those i like to say you know what i'm really excited because we've agreed on these seven points mm. here are the seven points like look how amazing we are yeah. all we got to do is get through these two and let's talk about it right That's right and then in those bargaining in those in that back and forth you're not just talking let's say it's it may be the dollars but it may be what's included in those dollars and that's really you have like your example with the with, on Instagram maybe you go back and you say you know I must have photos that is one of those things where I can't work with a client unless I have them what's a way that I can take those photos that would make you feel most comfortable so we could both get what we need. Mm. And the client may say, you know what? I'm cool being in your portfolio, but I don't want to be on social media. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Maybe we could work with that. Maybe that's okay for me. As long as I can get you on my portfolio, she just doesn't want to be splashed on Instagram for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. And you probably have enough clients that you can work that out. And so there's ways to find out like what is the true issue in those. And it may be that she says, nope, I won't agree to that. And you walk away. And that's right. the end. Right, and that's right, okay. right, right, right. <laughs> and that's the thing. You have to know that going in because, you know, and even then in that example, there is going to be certain situations where the full kit and caboodle is what the designer will want. And other times I'm like, okay, this is a great opportunity because to your point in the beginning, as the business owner there, the designer there, we want to go back to see, well, what other currencies am I going to get out of this? Right. So can I give up the Instagram 
photos and just have them in the portfolio. But if exactly. you've given up other currencies and it's sort of like, pfft, I'm not getting my one thing I wanted. I'm not getting these other four things. Mm -hmm. Now it's easier. It's not It's not emotional. Even that big job that you thought was going to be the most amazing job, it's like just look in the mirror now. It's really not the most amazing job anymore. That's the thing. We <laughs> romanticize certain right. jobs and clients. And then really when we get into the nitty-gritty and if we're really going working this process, we quickly realize it's not as valuable as we thought. Right. And so walking away is easier. Right. Um, I have a client she always comes to mind. She's a professional organizer in Los Angeles and all of her clients are very, very, very famous people, right? Mm -hmm. Which is very exciting. And we obviously want all of them all over our social media, but she can't, no. she's not allowed. Right. She's not even allowed to tell you who her clients are. And so one of the ways that she's worked around that is through referrals. She knows that working with these clients, they're going to say she is incredibly discreet. She's never going to talk mm. about it. You're never going to hear anything. So they pass her name around and her business is very successful in that way. So she actually has sort of shifted those currencies because those referrals are incredibly valuable to her more so than having particular clients on an Instagram. Um, and so sometimes revisiting and thinking about those currencies and what they are may change over time as well. And it's important to look at your business model and see how they change. That's so true in that regard there. You could see how the heck with being on Instagram yeah. if you're going to refer me to all of your like yes. A-list clients. Like, right. That's the whole point of Instagram, to get the clients. But exactly. if you're going to get them anyway. <laughs> that's exactly right. Right, um, right. But it can be a bit of a, a shift in how you think or what you know your big plan is or your marketing plan or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's good. Yeah. Um, you know, concessions are also really great during bargaining. So if there's something like we talked about your 5% where you're like, Luann, you don't care about this right do <laughs> it but make a really draw attention to it like right. i am giving you they don't know you don't care right oh and yeah so hold those concessions back in some ways where they think there may be an issue and be like you know what i'm willing to give on this mm -hmm. but i need you to give on that right. um and it really does start to feel a lot more collaborative particularly when you're discarding issues together because at the end of the day both parties really want to work together mm-hmm um, mm -hmm. So I think that that is really important to do during that bargaining. And it just starts, stops feeling like, I'll give you this if you give me that. And I'll give you this. <laughs> it's just like, ugh, right. nobody wants that. It really feels like you're working together to come to a situation where both sides are going to feel really great. Mm, I love it. It's so good. And and I know we kind of like got you off track a little there. Did we, did we go past four and five? <laughs> you yeah. Know, so like I thought so, right? Kind of, we mm -hmm. did. We did. No, that's okay. So we're strategizing. We're setting the climate, we're getting information, we're clarifying those positions and interests, and then we're bargaining. So those okay, are our so steps. And then our last- Four last... is clarifying and our interests yeah. and positions. Okay. Because I was lumping that in with number three. So clarifying yeah. our interests and positions. I love it. Yeah, okay. Exactly. And then we're agreeing and obviously memorializing it with a contract. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's it. We get to agreement and contract phase. I love it. And of course, you know, I, I, I'm going to- take a stab here just from my own personal experience once we get to contract phase we can start this whole process all over again there might be a point in there that we're like okay let's go back to strategy here Luann and let's go back to we got this far and this is what you know I put this out as the offering the proposal and this is the reaction and I might need to as a principal or designer I might need to go back again and say, hmm, this and that's important. This is non-negotiable. This isn't okay. And I might have to go back in and have more communication. And I might have to go back in and do active listening. And I might have to go back in and clarify what I think I understood them to say. Because you can go through this process multiple times in order to close a single deal, right, Jamie? I'm so glad you said that because so many people get to the contract part and then just sign it without thinking yeah. about it. Cause like, Oh my God, we finally made it here. Right. <laughs> you, you, you absolutely have to be prepared that you're going to have multiple waves of negotiation. All contracts should be negotiated. I've ne I've so rarely signed a contract on the first round where I haven't made some changes to it. And that isn't changes to be difficult. Cause I don't do that. And I do not believe in red. Like I'm not going to redline someone's grammar. Nothing irritates <laughs> me more than when a lawyer redlines for grammar. Oh my God. I was like, you just got paid your, your point one on your, 
oh for that grammar. God. Leave the grammar. Oh We're not wordsmithing. God. It's right? real issues. Um, and so those <laughs> there are real issues that come up in every single contract. Sometimes they're super fast. Sometimes they're very, very slow. Um, and so I just, it, I, I love that you said that. Just because you come to an agreement in principle doesn't mean that it's not, it's going to happen. Deals fall apart at the contract stage all the time, and that is okay. Right, right, right. Because the thing about it is, is you're entitled for it to reflect what you really wanted to get out of it. And you're entitled to shift what you really want out of it, right? Based on what you said, the options and the, and the currencies. But if it really ultimately doesn't isn't what you want. So you present your proposal to your client. You're, you know, you're a designer, you pr present your proposal and they turn around and f maybe there's something else that they, 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 you want them to pay you in full for design fees by your second or third visit with them, your second or third meeting. And you want them to pay, maybe you want them to pay 50% of design fees, but in full on all the furniture. And mm -hmm. you're going to get somebody that might say, I'm going to give you 50% on both. Well, mm -hmm. everything could be fine to that moment, but that doesn't mean it has to stay fine. You can say, well, I got news for you, sweetie. That's not what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, and of course, that's your inside voice. Your outside voice says, well, let's have a conversation about that because this is the way I run my business. <laughs> exactly. That's you exactly know, right. right? And you might have to start that whole back and forth over again. And when I say started back and forth over again, I know you know this, Jamie, it doesn't mean that the back and forth over again is adversarial. It doesn't automatically, right. it's just a conversation again, but in your mind and, and, and when you're learning these techniques is that's what the trigger here is, oh, go back to stage one, Luann. Go back mm -hmm. to stage one, Sally Smith designer, right? Like what? Okay. Yeah. So they don't want to do this in my contract. And the other thing is, I'm going to say, we can say to them at that moment, well, I'm not prepared to agree to that. And I'm not prepared to tell you what I'll agree to. I need to think about this. You can yeah. pull all the way back if you're new at this negotiating thing. You can pull all the way back, go all the way back to your studio. And that's when I want you to bring out Jamie's one to five steps again. And now instead of what your aspiration and what you expect that their wants and needs are, you've got it in cold, hard writing, what it is, and just reevaluate it again, right? And it also, it also may be understanding why that's a pain point for them. Maybe they had a really bad experience with another designer Great who screwed point. them. Great point. And so understanding why that's such a hard objection, particularly for something that is fairly common business practice in the space. And this happens all the time, right? Like you're like, oh, but that's just how we do things. Everybody does things. You're not going to find someone who doesn't do it this way. Understanding the why from them, like really listening and, and saying to them, you know, what is the issue? What is the problem will help you to craft the solution? Because mm -hmm. it may be like we're scared that you're going to screw us and you're like, OK, this is how we're going to fix that. I'm still going to get my money, but here's all the other assurances I'm going to give you so that you feel confident you, even if I do do something crazy you're not going to be left holding the bag. Mm, that's so key right there. I love that. I really yeah. do love that, Jamie, because you really can't craft the solution if you can't understand why they have a problem with that particular point of the yeah. contract. People aren't arbitrary. They don't just arbitrarily say, I'm not giving you that. There's a, usually a reason. I mean, look, like you said, there's the 1% people who are crazy. <laughs> and think, honestly, negotiations are also a gift insofar as all those red flags are going to come up. Right, right, right. <laughs> so if someone shows you who they are, listen. I know that's a very famous quote. I, maybe it was Maya Angelou who said that. Um, yes. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty, I think it's been attributed to her, but it's true. Yes. If somebody shows you that they're crazy, they're crazy. <laughs> this is just negotiation. You haven't even gotten to it. So welcome that knowledge and walk away. <laughs> right. It's the truth, right? Because that's another thing to be looking out for. If somebody really, you know, if you go in with an open mind and say, what is it about paying me in full for the furniture phase that is giving you a hard time? And you can just see the answers are just arbitrary and just really whatever, then that is a big red flag. Yes. Yes, because they're going to have issues with lots of other things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really good to know that. I mean, I have a very set engagement letter that I send and I have to comply with all kinds of ethical duties. And so like it really it, it can't change much, it can change a little. And I had a very long conversation with a, with a potential client and they came back to me and they wanted like 25 changes to my <laughs> engagement letter. And I was just like, no. 
That was it. Like, yeah, no. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> like, I'm not interested in negotiating this with you. We're done. And I actually <laughs> didn't even engage because that was my flag. I know that when that happens, I've, that, I've been doing this long. <laughs> like, weeks here and there, conversations, I am so open to all of this. But when I read this email, I'm like, oh, no. Right. right? <laughs> like, and we're done. <laughs> well, it's so, true because they, they weren't – like, somebody has that many things – yeah. Is 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 like you said, it's almost just for the the principle of like we mentioned lawyers before that just are, you know, arguing for the point of arguing. Right. Yeah. And that. Yeah, because that's just that is. And, it, and the thing is, is to start to really hear that. And yeah. honor that voice when that voice tells you, oh, this is not normal. <laughs> right. Well, I, I was going to say with that comes a tip that I give to all nego- people who are setting forth in a negotiation is this isn't personal. This is business. Mm. So focus on the problem. Don't focus on the personality. If someone rubs you the wrong way or says something kind of boneheaded in passing, it's business and it is straight up facts. But if somebody is, like we said before, speaking to you in a way that is unacceptable, is rude, you don't have to take that. Um, but don't take it personally. That's honestly, anybody who talks that way to other people, it's always about them. It's not about you. Right, right. <laughs> Something bad happened to them and they just happen to be taking it out on you, but you don't need to take that. Uh, but yes, I, it's, it's important to know those boundaries and know when it's time to walk away. A lot of that comes with experience, but also a lot of it comes with the confidence to trust your inner voice that's like screaming the red flag. Yes. Well, and two, because, you know, interior design, you're, you're getting in bed with somebody for many, many months, sometimes one and a half, two years. And if somebody is really at the very beginning of the process, which should be happy and joyful and hopeful and exciting, if they're already not a respectful person, not somebody that's looking for agreements and is looking for the exceptions and looking for the places to point out deficiencies, I mean, you know, what do we want to be engaged with this person for for that long? I totally agree with you. Right? Because cause the thing is, is there's likely to be a point where something does go wrong, like yeah. really wrong. And if somebody at the introductory, let's get to know you, let's get into <laughs> a relationship level is already looking for that, what happens when something is really oh. wrong? Right? Oh gosh. Yeah. Yes. No, you just, you know, you need to be able to know that you're working with somebody that at least their goal is to get to resolution, not their goal is to create conflict. I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's, it. it's tough. It's tough, but it takes a while because sometimes, you know, you need to put bread on the table and you take a job, yes. you know, but how do how do you get by it, Jamie? Right. You do it once or twice and then you say never again. <laughs> Correct. It really does come with a learning experience. <laughs> it, it is very, very true. Yeah. And you'll start to know what those are the more that you do it. Yeah, no, it's so true. It's so true. I have to say, I, I, I could talk about this for like a billion hours. I'm just going to tell you. <laughs> I just love it. So, Jamie, you, you know, your podcast is awesome. You give so much advice and tips and different things around negotiation and contracts and all types of stuff. Remind everybody how they find you. Thank you. So my podcast is the Fearless Business Podcast. Um, I also have a YouTube channel where I try to do like, I do some long videos, um, but I also do some short, like one to two minute quick, this is this legal term and this is what it means kind of thing and some Mm. other negotiation and conflict resolution and business advice. You can find my YouTube channel by just searching Jamie Lieberman. Um, and then hashtag legal, you can find us um, at hashtag dash legal dot com. And my Instagram is hashtag underscore legal. We definitely post similar content between YouTube and Instagram, but there's also different stuff. So uh, we try to post some of the longer stuff on YouTube. I love it. I love it. I have to say, you, you know, when you just said that we post quick tips about what legal terms mean, I saw one day recently, you were like, what does indemnification mean, yes! right? <laughs> And I had a laugh because 
that came up in one of the things that you and I, we were working on for me. And uh-huh. I must have like, I must have read the definition of indemnification like 10 times. I think I left you 20 voxers going, I don't know, try it again, Jamie. I'm not getting it. <laughs> yeah. It was such a like, it's this, it's that, it's this. And that's when that was the, that was the point that I was like, do I need to worry about this? And you're like, you do not. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> Yes, that is a really, really hard one to understand that can have some implications without fully understanding. So I did a quick, what is that? And the other one that I did recently was what is fair use, which is a, a, you know, something in copyright that no one understands. So that one people seem to be watching. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, it's crazy. It's so crazy. No legally. It's so true. And well, I always say you're the least lawyerly lawyer person I've ever met. And I love you and adore you, Jamie. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. Now you know why I adore Jamie, don't you? (laughs) I mean, she's so smart. She's so down to earth. And she truly is dedicated to helping us set up businesses that are well protected legally. Please check out her podcast too, The Fearless Podcast, for more information and strategies. And if you need to set up your business entity or have your contract revised, Jamie is your lady. This is the one other thing that I adore about Jamie too, that she'll work on a one-off capacity for any legal service you need. Find her at hashtag dash legal.com. And if you work with her, then you'll feel just like I do. So happy that I have Jamie in my corner. Now, negotiating is a learned skill, just like learning how to do floor plans. And just like learning to do floor plans, negotiating is critical to ensure your success. So I would suggest that especially if you were listening to this while you were walking or jogging or running or driving, that you go back and you really take this episode seriously and write down the five steps that Jamie outlined. Re-listen to it and really tap into the understanding, the nuance of the language and of the framing of conversations. Knowing how to sell, how to negotiate, it's important. It's And I want you to understand that It really is every bit as important as understanding the principles of scale and proportion. So don't leave this step undone in your business journey, right? And in your learning as a business person. And don't assume that because maybe you're not crazy like me and totally love it and would read about it and talk about it all the time, that you still can't learn to be better at it. And it is important because it's so important for not even not even just negotiating um, a higher fee or things like that. How about just conflict resolution, right? When you're in the middle of something and it's you on one side, your client on the other side, a contractor on the other side, and everybody's pointing fingers. This is where, this is the really where your negotiation skills are so, so valuable because sometimes you will negotiate for higher fees, right? But other times you'll negotiate to come to a place where everybody's happy and there's no money that you can place on that. If you can walk away and all the parties can really get to a place where they say, hey, we all came out good there. That was a good you know, solution. Then that's, you know, it's funny too, because we often talk about when you do a project and everything goes smoothly and it can sometimes be unmemorable in the smoothness, but any project that has a big bump in the road, That's a project where you have the potential to really make a good impression on somebody. It's because if you can clean up the problem, you can help everybody come out of it whole, you respect your client, you're your client's advocate, and they really can look to see that you're the leader in that, that's memorable, okay? So take the opportunity to learn more about negotiation. And we mentioned uh, Kwame Christian. Kwame was on the show um, also. I'll put the episode in the show notes. But his podcast is another outstanding podcast to listen to for straight up negotiation skills and tactics as well. So I want to recommend these resources to you uh, to improve your skills. And I would love to know if you have been able to put any of them to good use and resolve something and that you are proud of yourself for doing it. So if that happens, let me know. I'd love to hear it. Okay, that is our show for today. Thank 
thank you so much for joining me. I do really appreciate how you show up every day. I appreciate the way you communicate with me through Instagram and Facebook and through um you know, the reviews on iTunes and for the direct emails that you send me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Really do appreciate it. Um, Keep in mind the What Would Lou Do episodes. If you have a question that you like answered on air, you can send that to luannnigara.com forward slash WWLD. All right. I want you to go out and do something today, something that you did for yourself and your business. Decide to be excellent. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.